Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Sovereign God for Us and Through Us by David Eels. Narrated by Brad Moyers. Hello, friends. This is David Eels. Over the next few weeks, I would like to share with you this book called Sovereign God For Us and Through Us. It's going to be narrated by Brad Moyers. And uh, it's just full of testimonies of signs and wonders of people who have come to the revelation that the plan of Jesus was to be in his corporate body what he was in that individual body except around the world. That is doing the works of his Father. And I'm quite sure that you're going to enjoy the testimonies and enjoy the over 2,000 verses that are in this book that are referenced and probably many more that are not referenced. And I think it'll be a great blessing unto you. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. We now continue with Chapter 7 of Sovereign God, For Us and Through Us by David Eels. Christians, using the term loosely, can fall away. There is a great falling away today, but an even greater deception is coming. Before God sends judgment, He sends a working of error to weed out the church. Who will believe a lie? It is the evil and wicked who will believe a lie. Proverbs 17 verse 4 says, An evil doer giveth heed to wicked lips and a liar giveth ear to a mischievous tongue. Verse 11 says, An evil man seeketh only rebellion, therefore a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. The evildoer will be weeded out by deception. They are going to be seen clearly for who they are because they are going to buy the lie and fall away. The righteous love God's word and the truth and will not be deceived. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 19 says, for there must be also factions, which is the Greek word for heresies, among you, that they that are approved may be made manifest among you. It is necessary for heresies to be among us, so that they that are approved by God may be known. God is doing two things with deception and evil. He is revealing the wicked and revealing the true. This is God's method throughout history for separating his people from the tares. Birds of a feather flock together. God will gather the tares into bundles to burn them. Deception is one of God's methods for proving who will be counted worthy of the kingdom of heaven. Remember this working of Satan will come through power, signs, and lying wonders. These are placebos to pacify the church with replacements for the genuine to confirm the lies being taught. The genuine are listed as gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 through 11. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healings, workings of miracles, prophecy, discernings of spirits, kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. For our own safety, we should obey Paul who said, Learn not to go beyond the things that are written. How so many people can believe that some of these things we have been seeing are scriptural manifestations of the Holy Spirit is beyond me. When we look at the value of these silly signs as far as salvation, healing, deliverance, or provision, there is no comparison. Deuteronomy 13 verse 1 says, If there arise in the midst of thee a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he give thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, or Elohim, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Here we have a false prophet speaking a sign that comes to pass. No false prophet can command something and have it come to pass unless God says so. Lamentations 3 verse 37 says, Who is he who saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth not? This is clear that God is trying his people with error. This prophet is saying, Let us go after other gods. This is not as uncommon as we may think. Actually, the Hebrew word for gods here is the same word used everywhere else in the Old Testament for our God, Elohim. In this case, he is talking about a false Elohim. There are many false Elohim, because anyone who has a Jesus of their own making and not the Jesus of the Bible has a false Elohim. Deuteronomy 13 verse 3 says, 
Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or unto that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. False prophets prove us for God by deception. God is saying it is necessary for us to be proven by deception to see if we love him. Those who love him will not buy the lie. Deuteronomy 8 verse 2 says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God hath led thee these forty years in the wilderness, that he might humble thee, to prove thee, to know what was in thy heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or not. This is the whole point. A prophet, a dream, a vision, a teaching, or anything that comes to us that is not according to the commandments is a trial from God, to see if we are going to be counted worthy of the kingdom. Ezekiel 14 verse 1 says, Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their heart, and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? An idol is anything that demands more of our love, time, or money than God, self-will being the most evil idol. Should we ask the Lord's direction if all we want is what we want? It is dangerous to inquire of the Lord with self-willed motives before our face. We may satisfy our flesh but lose a blessing. Ezekiel 14 verse 4 says, Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Every man of the house of Israel that taketh his idols into his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him therein according to the multitude of his idols. God is not our God, and we are not his servants when our will is more important than his will. Before we ask God, we should ask ourselves if we would be as willing to go in the opposite direction should he give that answer. If we would not, then we have an idol. We should deal with our idol first. Ephesians 5 verse 5 says, For this you know of a surety, that no covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. The Greek word for covetous only means to desire more. A person who desires more than is necessary is an idolater. The word idolater comes from two words, idolo meaning that which is seen, and latres meaning a servant to. Those who constantly desire more are servants to that which is seen, physical things, not the Lord. These things can be anything, possessions, a job, a religion, or people to name a few. People can be serving themselves. They can be their own idol, like the son of perdition who sits in the temple of God making himself God. Judas, whom Jesus called the son of perdition, sat among the disciples who were the temple of God. He was his own idol because he only wanted to please himself. There are many Judases today. Exodus 20 verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Whatever is more important to us than the Lord is going to deceive us if we do not renounce it. Ezekiel 14 verse 7 says, For every one of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that separateth himself from me, and taketh his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet to inquire for himself of me, I the Lord will answer him by myself, and I will set my face against that man, and will make him an astonishment for a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Those who are separated from God through their idols will be answered according to the lusts of their own heart. God is going to give them an answer that is not a true answer because he will be answering their lusts. Remember, God said, I the Lord will answer him by myself. The Lord's answer may come through an apostate prophet, a religion, a thought, a dream, a word, or a doctrine, but it will come to deceive. This could bring chastening or even reprobation as we see in verse 8. Ezekiel 14 verse 9 says, And if the prophet be deceived and speak a word, I the Lord have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him, and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. A true prophet who has idols or a false prophet can be deceived by a false word from God, as we shall see. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10 says, God sendeth them a working of error, that they should believe a lie. The Lord sends the word because people do not love him, but the world. 1 John 2 verse 15 says, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We are here to prove who it is that loves God. God is going to cleanse his church in these days because there are many idols. Religion can be an idol. When the word of God says one thing and we believe our religion, which says another, our religion is our Babylonish idol. God will send deception. 
we can see how it can be an increasingly degenerative road to travel. The more we believe religion instead of God, the more deception comes in. Nothing but the word of God should move us. Romans 3 verse 4 says, God forbid, yea, let God be found true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified, or accounted righteous, in thy words, and mightest prevail when thou comest into judgment. When we agree with God in the midst of judgment, we will prevail. These are the people whom God accounts as righteous. When we receive a prophecy, vision, dream, revelation, or a word that agrees with the word of God, praise the Lord because the word does not give many specifics. It does not tell us where God wants us to live or work or whom he wants us to marry. It gives us principles to find out the true will of the Lord in all areas. We can desire something so much we hear, quote, the word of the Lord. We can become convinced that this is what the Lord wanted us to do, only to find out later that we miss God. We need to be careful, because if our desires are not for the will of God, first, we can be deceived. Let us look at Balaam's situation again from another angle. The children of Israel were in the plains of Moab. Balak, the king of Moab, was very fearful of the Israelites. He gathered together the elders of Midian and Moab. They decided they would hire Balaam to curse these people. Balak said to Balaam, I know that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. In Numbers 22 verse 6. He did not realize it was not Balaam, but God who counted in this situation because the curse that is causeless alighteth not. See Proverbs 26 verse 2. If Balaam spoke the word of the Lord, it was going to come to pass. The prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T, Balaam, went to the Lord with the promise of rewards in his heart and a request to curse Israel on his lips. Numbers 22 verse 12 says, And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning, and said unto the princes of Balak, For the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. Balak did not give up. He sent more honorable princes who offered to bestow upon Balaam a very high honor and give him anything he asked. Balaam decided to ask the Lord again since this sounded like a pretty good offer. Numbers 22 verse 19 says, Now therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here this night that I may know what the Lord will speak unto me more. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men are come to call thee, rise up, go with them. But only the word which I speak unto thee, that shalt thou do. Balaam did not like God's no, so God, wanting to put to death his covetous self-will, gave him a yes. Verse 21 continues, And Balaam rose up in the morning, and saddled his ass, and went with the princes of Moab. And God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord placed himself in the way for an adversary against him. Notice that God was angry that he went contrary to the first word spoken to him. The ass carrying Balaam to his reward saw the angel with his sword in the way and stopped, saving his life. Balaam, still ignorant of the angel, was furious and beat the ass. Then God opened the ass's mouth to reason with Balaam, who was so blinded by the prospect of reward that he did not realize that an ass was reasoning with him and making more sense than he was. Numbers 22 verse 32 says, And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I am come forth for an adversary, because thy way is perverse before me. The Hebrew word translated perverse here means headlong or self-willed. Because of this self-will, the Lord gave Balaam what he wanted to hear, and told Balaam to go and speak what he was told to speak. But when Balaam went, the angel of the Lord was waiting to kill him. Balaam got the following revelation through this. Numbers 23 verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and will he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and will he not make it good? God does not have to change his mind. He is God and does not make mistakes. From our perspective, God changes his mind because he warns or makes promises that are conditional upon our reactions. Balaam really wanted God to change his word. Have we ever been there? It is a dangerous place to be in if we want a straight answer from God. God can send deception that will lead to crucifixion of the flesh, or in more stubborn cases, reprobation, like a sword in our way. Jeremiah 4 verse 10 says, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying, Ye shall have peace, whereas the sword reacheth unto the life. Jude verse 11 says, Woe unto them, for they went in the way of Cain, and ran riotously in the error of Balaam for hire, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. 
We can be hired by our own selfish desires. Balaam wanted God to tell him yes and refused to hear God's no, so God told him yes. Be careful how much you want something from God. God wants us to submit our will to His, to desire what He wants, and to take Him at His word. Do not let your flesh be pampered by voices that speak contrary to what the word has already spoken, or God will send deception. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11 says, And for this cause God sendeth them a working of error, that they should believe a lie that they all might be judged who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Many have adopted deceptive doctrines that appease their selfish desires, such as doctrines of materialistic prosperity rather than sacrifice, unconditional eternal security so that they may live after the flesh without fear of God's warnings, rapture without purification through trial, eternal life without discipleship and holiness, etc. God's people have justified just about anything to appease their flesh, such as unscriptural divorces, abortion, drunkenness, drugs, lying, stealing, etc. Peace for the flesh is deception. Satan and his ministers are anxious to tell us what our flesh wants to hear. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 says, And no marvel, for even Satan fashioneth himself into an angel of light. It is no great thing, therefore, if his ministers also fashion themselves as ministers of righteousness. Balaam learned a lesson temporarily. Numbers 22 verse 18 says, And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. These were words of truth that came from a deceitful heart. Balaam still was covetous and eventually gave in to bribery again. He ended up teaching Balak how to cast a stumbling block in front of the children of Israel and teaching them how to eat food sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. See Revelation 2 verse 14. Balaam could not curse the children of Israel because of their position with God. Therefore, Balaam taught Balak to tempt Israel into a place where God would curse them. And that is exactly what happened. God knew what Balaam was doing. Israel was tried and flunked the test. After David sinned with Bathsheba, his own son Absalom usurped the kingdom and David had to flee for his life. Absalom inherited two counselors from David. 2 Samuel 16 verse 23 says, And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if a man inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. So the counsel that Ahithophel was giving to Absalom was good, just as if it was coming from God. 2 Samuel 17 verse 1 says, Moreover Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out twelve thousand men, and I will rise and pursue after David this night. And I will come upon him while he is weary and weak-handed, and will make him afraid. And all the people that are with him shall flee, and I will smite the king only. He wanted to catch David with a small quick force before David reached the depths of the wilderness. After they received this counsel from Ahithophel, Absalom called for Hushai the Archite, the other counselor. Hushai was secretly loyal to David. He advised the king to gather all Israel together and catch David and the people with him and smite every one of them. Hushai knew that it would take a while to gather all the people of Israel. Meanwhile, he sent word to David to quickly flee into the wilderness where he would be safe. 2 Samuel 17 verse 14 says, And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hushai the Archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord had ordained to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel, to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. With God's help, all the men of Israel agreed with the bad advice, which helped David escape and cost Absalom his life. Never follow the multitudes of those who profess religion. They follow a leadership that has usurped authority. When the Lord wants to judge someone, he can give a multitude of bad advice and lead him to take it. In these days, many will listen to the bad advice of their apostate leaders so that they will be judged. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel worshipped the image of the beast, the golden calf, at the advice of their leadership. See 1 Kings 12 verses 25 through 32. So it is today among those professing to be God's people because history always repeats itself. See Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. Most of what is only called Christianity will take the mark of the beast, but the true disciples will not be deceived, for they love the truth. Ahab, the evil king of the apostate northern ten tribes of Israel, was trying to convince Jehoshaphat, the good king of Judah, to align with him and go to war against the Syrians at Ramoth Gilead. This story applies to making alliances with evil and deception today. 1 Kings 22 verse 5 says, Then Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire first, I pray thee, for the word of the Lord. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth-Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? 
Remember these 400 men were not the prophets of Baal. They were killed in 1 Kings 18 by Elijah. Then the prophets of the Lord took over. We shall see these prophets of the Lord belong to Ahab. So he gathered up these 400 yes men and inquired of them about going to battle with the Syrians. 1 Kings 22 verse 6 continues, And they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Jehoshaphat still felt uneasy because the Lord put this in his heart to warn him. Verse 7 continues, But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we may inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah the son of Imlah. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Fetch quickly Micaiah the son of Imlah. And Zedekiah the son of Chenana made him horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push the Syrians until they be consumed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. And the messenger that went to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak thou good. It is tempting to agree with consensus. Verse 14 continues, And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. And when he was come to the king, the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go up and prosper, and the Lord will deliver it in the hand of the king. Realize that Micaiah's words, Go up and prosper, were from the Lord. Micaiah made a vow that what the Lord said he would say. God through Micaiah was telling the king to go up and prosper because that was the answer King Ahab wanted. Like Balaam, he got the answer he wanted. God is sovereign over deception, but no one is guiltless when they are deceived. Verse 16 continues, And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou speak unto me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? And he, Micaiah, said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the mountains, as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. One truthful prophet who was not motivated by gain prophesied the death of Ahab and the loss of the battle. Verse 18 continues, And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And Micaiah said, Therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. In Job 1 verse 6, the sons of God were gathered together before the Lord, and Satan was there among them. What was he doing there? It says here, all the hosts of heaven on his right hand and on his left. Whom did the Lord gather on his left? It was the goats and the wicked. See Matthew 25 verse 33. 1 Kings 22 verse 20 says, And the Lord said, Who shall entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? The Lord was asking for a spirit to deceive Ahab. And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit, and stood before the Lord, and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Notice that the spirit said, His prophets, not your prophets. And he, God, said, Thou shalt entice him, and shalt prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. Notice thy prophets. These prophets did not belong as much to the Lord as they did to Ahab. The apostate leadership of the northern ten tribes was deceived by God to lead them into a battle they could not win. Here are 400 prophets of the Lord prophesying by a lying spirit. They were probably fed from Ahab's table and desired his favor. It was 400 false prophets to one true prophet. That is the same case we have today. They love the hire of wrongdoing. What motivates a Christian to agree with their religion or preacher when they disagree with the Word of God? This is the idolatry that deceives their heart. We must be true to the Lord and not be influenced by respect of men. I was a guest speaker in an assembly once where the pastor was to speak before me. As he walked around sharing some things, he walked by me and said, Isn't that right, David? I softly said no and shook my head. The pastor did a double take but walked away and went right on speaking. Later, he walked by me again and the same thing happened. Finally, the man behind me could not stand it any longer and asked, Did you say no? I answered yes, and if he didn't want my truthful opinion, he shouldn't ask. After the service, the pastor came and asked me what was wrong. I told him that his statements were wrong and the truth was such and such according to the word. 
I also asked him not to ask me any more questions in the assembly. Well, he did not throw me out and I ended up doing a lot of the teaching there for a while. Ahab did not trust his 400 prophets and he feared that one prophet. 1 Kings 22 verse 30 says, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. And a certain man drew his bow at a venture, which is Hebrew for in his simplicity, and smote the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. It appears that this Syrian was shooting in the general direction of the enemy and smote Ahab right in the joints of his armor. We cannot fool God. I do not know who was simpler, the man who drew the bow or Ahab who thought he could hide from the wrath of God by changing his clothes. There are several good morals to this story. Firstly, you cannot go by the majority. Here was a case of 400 to 1 and the majority was wrong. Throughout history, the majority of what is called God's people have been wrong. Secondly, you have to look carefully at your motives when you inquire of the Lord. If your motives are impure, you will get an answer that your flesh wants. In this case, Ahab got the answer he wanted and was killed. Jehoshaphat was chastened and almost lost his life for making an alliance with an evil king. He did not learn his lesson and later aligned with Ahab's evil successor, losing his life and his works. See 2 Chronicles 20 verse 35 to chapter 21 verse 1. We can be deceived by wanting our desires or following the majority. It does not have to be a prophet that speaks to us. The Lord can give us a dream, vision, doctrine, or man we respect who can lead us astray. God can answer us according to our idols before our face. When Jeroboam was the king of the northern ten tribes, he was afraid that his people would go and worship in the ordained temple at Jerusalem and, in so doing, stay and serve the king of Judah. He decided that he would erect altars for the people in Bethel and Dan. Jeroboam then made two golden calves and called them in Hebrew Elohim. See 1 Kings 12 verse 28. He put the name of our God on his own creation. Aaron did the same thing when Israel came out of Egypt. He built a golden calf and called it in Hebrew YHWH and Elohim. The apostate religions teach a Jesus of their own creation, not the Jesus of the Bible. Paul called him another Jesus in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. Jeroboam and his people were serving another Jesus. The golden calf was the Egyptian god Apis, who was called the Creator. In other words, they were worshipping the god they knew in the world before they ate the lamb and came out of Egypt. Many Christians are worshipping a Jesus that is acceptable to the world and the flesh. He is not the true god, but an imposter. Jeroboam and his apostates were also making priests, or ministers, who were not Levites. See 1 Kings 12 verse 31. This tells me that in ten of the twelve tribes, the ministers were not ordained of God, but apostates. That is exactly what has happened in the church today. Of the twelve spies, ten brought an evil report and died in the wilderness because they made the congregation to speak against the Lord. See Numbers 14 verses 36 through 38. God sent a young prophet to prophesy against the altar in Bethel. In Hebrew, Bethel means house of God. Of course, they called it the house of God, but it was a false house of God because the true house was in Jerusalem. At that time, the king was standing at the altar offering incense before the people. When the prophet prophesied against the altar, the king stretched out his arm and pointed his hand at the prophet and told his men to seize him. At that point, the king's hand dried up and he could not draw it back. The altar rent and ashes poured out, which the prophet prophesied would happen. This obviously symbolized that God did not accept their sacrifices in this place of apostasy. The king asked the prophet to restore his hand, so the prophet prayed and the Lord restored the king's hand. As a result, the king wanted to take the prophet home and reward him. The prophet declined, for he was commanded by the Lord to neither eat bread nor drink water in that place. See 1 Kings 13 verses 8 and 9. What place was that? It was the place where God's people were in apostasy and where their leaders were not ordained of God. It was an apostate religious system. We must not eat their bread. This represents partaking of a false Jesus since he was the bread of life. See John 6 verse 48. Jesus is also the Word. See John 1 verse 1. Jesus said to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven changes the bread, the Word, to make it more acceptable to the flesh. Neither should we drink their water, which represents the false spirit formed by a false word. Jesus commanded us to come unto him and drink of the living water of the Spirit through the Scriptures. John 7 verse 37 says, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him were to receive. Without this, any Jesus we might know is another Jesus. 
the prophet was being obedient and was leaving those backslidden people. In this city of Bethel, there was an older prophet who had heard what the young prophet did. He saddled his ass and caught up with him. 1 Kings 13 verse 15 says, Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it is said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And he said unto him, I also am a prophet as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thy house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. The young prophet falsely believed that God had changed his word that was originally given, and so ate and drank of the apostate word. We are told in Jude verse 3 to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Today many without scriptural foundation tell us that after the apostles God changed what he called an eternal covenant. This lie has robbed the church of its power by replacing Jesus with a golden calf. Daniel and his three friends would not defile themselves with Babylon's food. See Daniel 1 verses 5 through 16. After refusing Babylon's food, they were said to have ten times the wisdom and understanding of those who did eat. See Daniel 1 verses 17 through 21. They also were the only ones to not bow down to the image of the beast. See Daniel 3 verses 12 and 18. Babylon's version of the golden calf. The young prophet was deceived into a modern gospel. 1 Kings 13 verse 20 says, And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast been disobedient unto the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread and drank water in the place of which he said to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water, thy body shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. The Lord tried the young prophet, but he was said to have not kept the commandment of the Lord, which was synonymous with partaking of apostate spiritual food. He lost his life in that place as many do today. The old prophet of God spoke a lie for personal gain. That place had leavened him, and he was now a false prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T. We must respect the word of God so much that nothing can turn us away from it to another Jesus. We have to remain on guard, for even vessels of honor can be used as vessels of dishonor to try us. When the young prophet left, a lion met him in the way and slew him. 1 Kings 13 verse 26 says, Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him, and slain him according to the word of the Lord. The lion was given permission from God to kill the one who ate the apostate spiritual food. 1 Peter 4 verse 8 says, The devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. May is used here because the devil must have permission to devour. He is ordained to devour apostates. The penalty for the young prophet's apostasy was that he would not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers, spiritually meaning he was not joined with his fathers in death. Therefore he would not be among the righteous resurrection. One who partakes of a false word from the false Jesus will lose his life by the devil and will not be among the righteous in resurrection. Revelation 22 verse 18 says, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto them, God shall add unto him the plagues which are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life. Galatians 1 verse 8 says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, should preach unto you any gospel other than that which we preached unto you, let him be anathema, or the Greek word cursed, devoted to destruction. The Lord tested the Apostle Paul by his spirit. Acts 19 verse 21 says, now after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. Neither spirit here nor Holy Spirit in the following verses is capitalized in the Greek, because the Greek language has no capitalization. This means we must determine from the text if spirit is Holy Spirit. Since the and not his is used before spirit, we know that God is speaking of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, spirit in this and the following verse should be capitalized in English. That was a translator's mistake. Paul determined in the spirit that he was going to Jerusalem and then to Rome. He could have only gotten that revelation from God because it was in the future. Acts 20 verse 22 says, And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Spirit testifieth unto me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. It was the Holy Spirit telling Paul to go to Jerusalem where he could expect bonds and afflictions. Acts 21 verse 4 says, 
And having found the disciples, we tarried there seven days. And these said to Paul through the Spirit, that he should not set foot in Jerusalem. Notice that this was just the opposite of what the Holy Spirit had told Paul he was going to do three times before. I suggest to you that Paul was being proven by the Spirit as to whom he would listen. Other disciples were offering a new word. He was being given an opportunity to obey his flesh and avoid the spiritual cross, just as in the cases of Balaam and the young prophet. Acts 21 verse 10 says, And as we tarried there some days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And coming to us, and taking Paul's girdle, he bound his own feet and hands, and said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Having been told by the Spirit again that he would go to Jerusalem and be persecuted, he was now going to be tried by human sentiment. Verse 12 continues, And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do ye? weeping and breaking my heart, for I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. Paul was tried by human sentiment and prophecy and overcame. He obeyed what the Lord told him, which is the important thing. The Lord will try us by his spirit to see if we will believe what he has told us. To Abraham was born the long-promised seed Isaac. God promised to make his covenant with Isaac and his seed after him, See Genesis 17 verse 19, a seed which God said would be as the stars for multitudes. See Genesis 15 verse 5. Genesis 15 verse 6 says, And he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. This was not enough for God. Abraham's faith had to be tried. After many years of waiting in faith, Isaac was born. Then an even greater trial came. Genesis 22 verse 1 says, God did prove Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, even Isaac, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Hebrews 11 verse 17 says, By faith Abraham, being tried, offered up Isaac, even he to whom it was said, In Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God is able to raise up, even from the dead, from whence he did also in a figure receive him back. Abraham believed God's original promise to him to the extent that even if he sacrificed Isaac, God would have to raise him up to fulfill the promise. We need to believe the original promises above all that we see and hear. God will prove or try us through religion, ministers, spoken word, or well-meaning friends. We are tried by external circumstances, but we are tempted by our own lusts, not God. See James 1 verses 13 and 14. External trials and internal temptations are necessary to prove who loves God. See James 1 verse 12. God waited until the last seconds, when Abraham was about to plunge the knife into Isaac, to stop and say to him, Now I know that thou fearest God. There is no proof that we believe God's promises until we are tried. The Lord then provided a ram caught in a thicket for a sacrifice in the place of Isaac, the seed of Abraham. This, of course, typified Jesus who died in the place of all the seed of Abraham, including we who believe. I once asked God to give me a new car, which he did six months later. After a year or so, he told me to sell it. I was a little grieved and preferred to sell my other car because it was smaller and I had five children. I obeyed the Lord and offered the car and the papers for a fair market price. After advertising it for a couple of months, I asked the Lord why, if he wanted me to sell it, were there no buyers? He said to me, I wanted you to sacrifice it as Abraham sacrificed Isaac. I said, but Lord, Abraham did not sacrifice Isaac. Then I saw that the Lord was trying me in the same way as Abraham, to see if I would sacrifice what was important to me. God told me to sell my other smaller car, which I did not need at the time. I was relieved. God will tell our spirit what he wants us to do. Dreams, visions, revelations, or spoken words will agree with our spirit, but not our flesh. When God sends us to a cross, we are going to be tried to not go. We can also be tried to go beyond the Lord. A brother had a vision he believed was from God. I felt it was a trial. In the vision, the Lord told him to sell everything and go out on the mission field. Many come back from the mission field wounded because they were sent by religion, not God. We considered whether this was a true word from God or a trial. I asked him a few questions. He was afraid to go, but he didn't want to miss God and lacked faith. I knew this brother was there to be fed and prepared to minister, but I knew he was not ready. I advised him to pray, but if God did not speak it in his spirit, to ignore it. Thank God he did. We should do nothing when we are uncertain of God's direction. We should not be led by prophecy or by dreams and visions when they disagree with our own spirit. 
These are wonderful confirmations and direction for what we feel in our spirit. We are to be led by the Spirit of God. If God puts something scriptural in our spirit, we should let no one talk us out of it. Peter was used to try Jesus in this way. Jesus told the disciples that he was to die at Jerusalem, and Peter rebuked him. Matthew 16 verse 22 says, And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall never be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art a stumbling block unto me, for thou mindest not the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus knew that he was being tempted by Satan through Peter to do his own fleshly will. Sovereign God, For Us and Through Us by David Eels Chapter 8 God's Sovereignty Over Sickness, Death, and the Curse See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Deuteronomy 32 verse 39 Our God wounds and kills. Does that make you uncomfortable? For many people it is very uncomfortable. Most feel that only Satan or men would wound and kill. But they are only vessels. Only God has all authority in heaven and earth. See Matthew 28 verse 18. God does all these things because he is the righteous judge. God is truly working on us from both directions. He sent the curse to turn us from sin and he sent our Savior to deliver those that do. He says, I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. This motivates us to please, fear, and obey Him. When God sends the curse to bring repentance, can man deliver from it without repentance? That is what the sinner wants, blessing without repentance. Man has sought out many inventions to try to circumvent repentance, but they have all come back to curse Him. Are we stronger than God? God said, there is none that can deliver out of my hand. This is contrary to the deception of the world, but it is God's purpose for the world to be deceived in this. We cannot get anyone out from under a curse except through the gospel. Sometimes God is merciful, but we cannot guarantee God's deliverance to those who do not walk under the blood. Those ministries who are in agreement with God will administer His gifts of healing, deliverance, and provision to the ones who are in line for God's blessings through repentance, faith, and justification. God, through Paul, delivered a man to Satan to bring him to repentance. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5 says, To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Whether we understand it or not, the purpose God turns some over to Satan or demons is good. They chasten and cause some to count the high cost of sin. It is important that we understand that it is God who ultimately is in charge. Otherwise, we had better start fearing the devil. If the devil ever has authority to do what he wants to do, we have reason to fear him. But Jesus forbids that. Luke 12 verse 4 says, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, speaking of Satan and demons through men, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him who after he hath killed, hath power, which is the Greek for authority, to cast into hell. We are not to be afraid of the vessels that God uses. Only God has authority to cast into hell after he is killed. Have we ever heard it said, God does not cast anyone into hell? There is a shred of truth to that. The demons may cast in, but the Lord has the authority. He alone are we commanded to fear. The reason that God can tell those who follow him to be anxious for nothing is because he is always in control. God is never wrong. People blame God for the death of a loved one or some other tragedy, but he is always right in what he does. We must realize that God has bound himself with his word. Psalms 119 verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Once he says something, he must stand by it, or he is a liar and breaks his word. If he makes a condition in the word for his benefits, we must meet that condition. Romans 1 verse 16 says, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Can we expect God's provisions without believing his word? Many unbelieving Christians endure much hardship because they have not met the condition. Then they say, It must not have been God's will to deliver, heal, or bless me. Jesus never said that God's will was the reason his people did not receive these things. He said, Because of your unbelief, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Thy faith hath made thee whole, and according to your faith be it done unto you. In his own hometown, Jesus could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. See Matthew 13 verse 58 and Mark 6 verse 5. If we have a problem, we should blame ourselves. 
Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Matthew 7 verse 2 says, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, or give out, it shall be measured unto you. If we were living in unforgiveness and yet praying for God to heal our body, would not God have to break his word in order to heal us? Matthew 6 verse 15 says, But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. James 5 verse 16 says, Confess therefore your sins one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. Can we expect God to give to us when we will not first give? Luke 6 verse 38 says, Give and it shall be given unto you. What God does is right and righteous. Those who start out believing in the sovereignty and good purpose of God do not question God. They believe God is in control and trust Him. If we deal with the cause, we will not have to deal with the curse. Why is it that we see the devil mentioned so seldom in the scriptures, but yet so often he is on the lips of Christians? They are constantly saying that the devil did this and the devil did that. He is only an angel, the Greek word messenger, but the world and the worldly church have made him a god, the god of this world. He is a created being used to bring to pass God's purposes. Jesus, through his sacrifice, took away the devil's power of death, see Hebrews 2 verse 14, for those who believe. He never had the authority of death. Authority is the right to use power. 1 Samuel 2 verse 6 says, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to Sheol and bringeth up. Death and life are in the hand of the Lord, not any other. But again, that does not negate our responsibility. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. We need to be careful to agree with God's word that we fall not under the curse. See Revelation 22 verses 18 and 19. Numbers 14 verse 28 says, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Matthew 12 verse 37 says, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. God reacts to the way we react to his word. Everything is subject to the word God has spoken, even his own will. Psalms 138 verse 2 says, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God puts the word first as a standard to trust even above his own name, which in Hebrew means character and authority. God wants us to know that he puts his word above any desire or purpose that we might think he has, but his word is his desire and purpose. 1 Samuel 2 verse 7 says, The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich, he bringeth low and also lifteth up. Many Christians think that it is by their own wisdom or by hard work alone that they prosper. We are all taught from an early age that to have a prosperous life you must seek out all the worldly means to be successful. However, God says, Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In Matthew 6, verse 33. If we seek first the world, we will do without the kingdom. But if we seek first the kingdom, we will have our needs met. Philippians 4, verse 19 says, And my God shall supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God will supply our every need to further his will and kingdom in our life. He will also do this for us while we promote his kingdom in the lives of others. By the grace of God, I was doing this when God told me, You are never going to work for man again. The Lord showed me that I was to promote his kingdom in Pensacola, Florida. Since I had no way to buy a house and car, and I had stayed away from debt for many years, I asked the Lord to freely give these to me there. Within six months, he had given me what I had asked. However, he did have me give the house and car that I had away. He has been providing for us ever since. So you see, I believe God will supply our every need. Who fed and cared for the wives and children of the disciples as they followed Jesus for three and a half years and afterwards? Paul said that they had wives in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 5, and where there were wives there were children in those days. Kingdom prosperity is not the world's prosperity. Proverbs 13 verse 7 says, There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. We have not been put here to make ourselves rich or to make the old man prosperous. We have been put here to make the spiritual man prosperous. Jesus and the disciples are our examples. They had no love for the things of the world. See 1 John 2 verse 15. As much as the prosperity folks would like to make Jesus rich because of his seamless garment or to jam that camel through the eye of the needle, it cannot be done in honesty. The Lord gives authority to the devil to tempt us with riches. Matthew 4 verse 1 says, Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Verse 8 continues, Again the devil taketh him unto an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The devil offered Jesus all the things of the world if he would serve him. 
Matthew 6 verse 24 says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. This is God's way of finding out who loves him and weeding out his flock. Those who use faith to be rich are asking to be deceived. In 1 Timothy 6 verses 5 through 11, the believer is commanded to be content with food and covering and to flee the love of money which leads astray from the faith with the temptations of many foolish and hurtful lusts. The rich hoard up someone else's food and supplies for vanity. According to God, there is just enough supply on earth to feed everyone. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 11 says, When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what advantage is there to the owner thereof, save the beholding of them with his eyes? Starving people will point their fingers on judgment day. God sent the curses to motivate men to repent and obey him. Here is the portion of the curse that indicates who sent it. Deuteronomy 28 verse 15 says, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Verse 20 continues, The Lord will send upon thee cursing, discomfiture, and rebuke, and all that thou puttest thy hand unto to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly, because of the evil of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. The Lord will make the pestilence cleave unto thee, until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest in to possess it. The Lord will smite thee with consumption, and with fever, and with inflammation, and with fiery heat, and with the sword, and with blasting, and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. Verse 24 continues, the Lord will make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. The Lord will cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and shalt flee seven ways before them. And thou shalt be tossed to and fro among all the kingdoms of the earth. Verse 27 continues, The Lord will smite thee with the boil of Egypt, and with the emeralds, and with the scurvy, and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord will smite thee with madness, and with blindness, and with astonishment of heart. Verse 35 continues, The Lord will smite thee in the knees and in the legs, with a sore boil, whereof thou canst not be healed, from the sole of thy foot unto the crown of thy head. The Lord will bring thee, and thy king whom thou shalt set over thee, unto a nation that thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. Notice that the Lord will send the curse. Why is it that the worldly church says that God does not do these things? Why and how does God do this? Verse 47 continues, Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart, by reason of the abundance of all things, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies that the Lord shall send against thee. God uses enemies to administer the curse on the rebellious. It is black or white. If we are not serving the Lord, we are serving our enemies that the Lord sends. The Lord sends the curse and the enemy for chastening. That is the part the devil, demons, and the wicked play. It is the Lord taking credit, so we know we have to fear the Lord and serve him with joyfulness and a glad heart by reason of abundance of all things. Some might think their particular curse is not listed in Deuteronomy 28 and is, therefore, not under the Lord's dominion. Deuteronomy 28 verse 61 says, also every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee, until thou be destroyed. Oops. Proverbs 3 verse 7 says, Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Those who fear and repent have every right to claim the sacrifice of Jesus for deliverance from the curse. Galatians 3 verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that upon the Gentiles might come the blessing of Abraham in Christ Jesus. What was the blessing of Abraham? Genesis 24 verse 1 says, And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Glory to God, the entire curse that was due us was put on Jesus. All we have to do is repent and believe. We have been blessed in all things. Numbers 14 verse 11 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me, for all the signs which I have wrought among them? I will smite them with the pestilence, and disinherit them, and will make of thee a nation greater and mightier than they. It is not as though we do not have an example of God doing this. In Noah's day, God did just that and repopulated his earth with Noah's sons. Our text is speaking about the time when the twelve spies entered into Canaan's land. God had promised Canaan's land to his people. It was the promised land. The ten spies brought back the evil report that they were not able to go up and take the land from the Canaanites. This angered God because he had told them that he had given them this land. 
Canaan's land is a type of our body. Both that land and our body are made from dirt. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9 says, For we are God's fellow workers, ye are God's husbandry, which is Greek for tilled land, God's building. God wants the fruit of Christ, the spiritual man, to grow up in his land. God warns those who have partaken of his spirit and word to not fall away as land that does not bear fruit. Hebrews 6 verse 7 says, For the land which hath drunk the rain, meaning spirit and word, that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them for whose sake it is also tilled, receiveth blessing from God. But if it beareth thorns and thistles, it is rejected and nigh unto a curse, whose end is to be burned. God curses the land that does not bear fruit. For those who have been born again, God has given us this land, or body, to be totally controlled by the spiritual man. God sent the Israelite, the spiritual, born-again man, to take the promised land from the Canaanites, who represented the lust of the flesh, the old man. The names of the tribes of Canaan in Hebrew describe the lust of the flesh. See Genesis 10 verses 15 through 18. Their kings represent the principalities and powers that rule over the flesh. Today, 10 out of 12 ministers bring the evil report that we are not able to take this land. They teach that we should be satisfied to be forgiven, but that we cannot expect to be sanctified of the lusts of the flesh in order to rule this land for God. In this type, God is clearly telling us to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word. See Hebrews 4 verse 12. Put to death the old man that lives in our land, take over his house, and raise our crops, or fruit of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says, Having therefore these promises, or sword of the word, Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God will not tell us to do something that we cannot do by faith in Him. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I, or the old man or Canaanite, that live, but Christ, the new man or Israelite, living in me. To those who do not believe the good report, God will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. Joshua and Caleb believed that the promised land was theirs and that they could take it from the Canaanite. Numbers 14 verse 9 says, Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is removed from over them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. The old man is bred for the new man. The spiritual man grows as he devours the old man. Since they occupy the same territory, the old man has got to die so that the spiritual man can live and grow. For those who believe, the Lord has removed the defense of the old man. Joshua 1 verse 3 says, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, to you have I given it, as I spake unto Moses. The word of God is also a type of the land of promise. Every promise that we stand on, God is going to give it to us. I am not a denominational person, but I have shared in these churches. It is clear to me that each sect believes a portion of the word, which yields the promised benefit. Members of these sects are being delivered to believe increasingly more of the word and consequently to receive increasingly more of the benefits. Today much of what we hear in the churches is the evil report. Their thinking is that we cannot act in faith that God will heal, provide, sanctify, or deliver from the curse because we do not know his will. To them I say, get in the word and find out his will so that you do not do without. God in his sovereignty says, to you have I given it. Genesis 7 verse 4 says, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth. Join us next time for the continuation of this chapter in Sovereign God, For Us and Through Us by David Eels. For more information and materials, or to download and read Sovereign God for free, go to www.americaslastdays.com.